So hello everybody, it's 12.15 p.m., so I think we will get started. I'd like to welcome everybody here in person and also to those of you who are joining on Zoom to this public lecture in STL's public lecture series here at the Peking University School of Transnational Law, Beijing Dashi Guoji Fa Yun. And STL is just, for those of you who may not know, a shorter name of our law school, School of Transnational L, STL for short. Uh, my name is Norman Ho and I teach here at the law school. Uh, we're very privileged and honored today to have as our guest speaker, Professor Daniel Chow, who serves as the Basler Chair and Professor of Law at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law in the United States. Uh, Professor Chow works and teaches in the areas of international trade, international intellectual property, uh, Chinese law, and also teaches US civil procedure and property. Uh, he's the author of one of the leading case books in international business transactions in the United States, as well as various scholarly articles in law reviews. And in terms of, of his practical experience, uh, Professor Chow has also lived and worked in China for many years, uh, having previously served as head of the legal department for a major multinational companies operations here in China. Uh, Professor Chow will speak to us today on the topic of the future of dispute resolution in international trade in a post-WTO world. He will speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, after which we will open the floor for questions. For the students here, um, also just to let you know, Professor Chow will be teaching here at STL. Um, later this fall, and so you might want to take uh, one of his courses perhaps, and he also has served as a visiting professor here before. Um, so uh, without further delay, I would like to now give the floor to Professor Chow. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming to my uh, talk. <clears throat> so the title of the talk is the Future of Disp Dispute Resolution in International Trade in a Post-WTO World. Uh, the WTO, of course, is the World Trade Organization. And when I say a post-WTO world, the reason I say that is because right now, <clears throat> the WTO is in a crisis. It's no longer fully functional uh, due to the paralysis of the appellate body, which I'll be discussing in this paper. So the WTO is, um, it, it may never return to a fully functioning state. We may be in a, uh, in a world in which, um, uh, it's, I call it a post-WTO world because um, we may never see the WTO return to its past glory um, and to its past fully functional mode. Um, and that, of course, is going to be, I'll be discussing that in great detail in this talk. Um, so just let me talk a little bit about the background of the WTO for those of you who are not uh, experts in the field. Um, the World Trade Organization was founded in 1995, but its origins can be traced back really to the Second World War. Um, at the end of the Second World War, a group of nations met at, in the... Uh, conference called the Bretton Woods Conference in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to put into place the economic institutions uh, that would be the, econ the framework uh, for the global economy post-war. And what many of the nations wanted to do was to create an international system uh, that would prevent the disastrous economic policies that contributed to the eruption of the Second World War. Um, so what was going on that led to the Second World War and what is it that these countries wanted to prevent? Well, in the period leading up to the Second World War, it was a period in which was marked by protectionism and nationalism. This was a, a period in time in which countries imposed prohibitive tariffs on imports. Um, United States, for example, in the Smoot-Harley Tariff Act, imposed tariffs that average 53% of the value of the product. And when you have tariffs this high, uh, you're not gonna have trade. And in fact, the purpose 
of many of these tariffs was to prevent trade. And this is because nations viewed each other with mistrust and with hostility. Um, and because of this, there was a great deal of conflict in the world. And when you have economic conflict, military conflict um, is often not too far behind. And so these were the policies that led to um, the eruption of the Second World War. So in the Bretton Woods Conference, um, the parties, the 13 nations who were there, created a triumvirate of institutions. That is a fancy word for a trio, or three international institutions, um, to create this post-war economic framework. The first was the World Bank, which still exists today, um, which is a bank to lend money for the reconstruction of Europe after the destruction of the Second World War, and also today mostly to lend money to developing countries so they can modernize their economies. The second um, institution created by the Bretton Woods Conference was the International Monetary Fund, which um, today exists as well, and it exists for the purpose of regulating currency regulations so that countries can't manipulate their currency by changing exchange rates. And the third institution that was created by the Bretton Woods Agreement was the International Trade Organization, which was meant to liberalize rules of international trade. That organization never came into existence because of opposition by the United States. And instead, a, an agreement called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, was implemented as a really a jump start to trade liberalization and was to be administered by the ITO. But as the ITO never came into existence, the GATT existed for about 50 years as a treaty without an organization to run it. And so when the WTO was founded in 1995, it was founded to take the place of the ITO, the International Trade Organization, that never came into existence. Uh, but of course, it also went way beyond the ITO. So the WTO has many functions uh, that go beyond what was contemplated for the International Trade Organization. If we look at the World Trade Organization today and try to simplify what it does, it essentially does two, it has two main functions. One function is to serve as a form for trade negotiations so that you can have countries that can enter into agreements, trade agreements, um, through um, negotiations, and also resolve any other trade issues also through negotiations. And the second main function of the World Trade Organization is dispute settlement, which is it serves as a forum uh, which allows countries to resolve trade disputes without going to war, right? Um, and so that is really the function of the WTO. And if you ever go to the WTO offices in Geneva, you will find that um, in the WTO headquarters, you have offices of every WTO country, a permanent office of every WTO country, uh, which means that there are representatives from the WTO countries from all around the world who are there all the time. And they can both serve to engage in trade negotiations as well as dispute resolution. One of the major accomplishments of the WTO was this creation of a effective dispute settlement system. Um, and it was a great advance over the GATT. Um, the biggest issue under the GATT um, was that in the dispute resolution that existed at the time under the GATT was the losing party could block the adoption by the parties of any decision. Uh, uh, rendered on the dispute, meaning that um, the, adopt, the, the uh, decision could never be adopted. So the WTO replaced that system, which was informal under the GATT, with a much more legalistic and judicial uh, model, and a model that was really based upon litigation, a litigation model, um, and it resolved many of the deficiencies of the GATT among them was that the losing party could no longer block the adoption of a report. Um, and uh, the dispute settlement system was set up in 
the WTO dispute settlement understanding. That's an agreement. And the agreement was an agreement that all parties had to sign or all parties submitted to when they joined the WTO. So it was mandatory. And <clears throat> under the DSU, um, you had then this mandatory system of dispute settlement, um, which replaced then the more informal system of the GATT. Now, the dispute settlement system in the WTO consists of essentially three bodies. The first body is the panel, which operates like a trial court uh, in a domestic legal system. And it resolves disputes between, in the first instance, between member countries of the WTO. The second body is the appellate body, which functions like a high court of international trade, an appellate court. And it reviews decisions of the panel, which it can uh, affirm, uphold, the, way the, the words they use, um, or it can reverse those decisions. And then the third body is called the dispute settlement body, which consists of all of the members of the WTO. Now, all decisions of the panel and any decisions of the appellate body must be adopted by the dispute settlement body, that is the entire WTO membership, before the decision can become legally effective. So the final word on whether the decision will be legally effective is the DSB, because the DSB must adopt it or else the decision has no legal effect, right? But the way it's set up, the way that the system is set up is that the DSB will adopt decisions in all but the most unusual circumstances um, because the, WT, the appellate body, excuse me, the DSB operates on the principle of reverse consensus, meaning that it will adopt a decision unless every member of the WTO votes to reject it which is highly unlikely. If one member votes to adopt it, it will be adopted. So it means that under the principle of reverse consensus, most decisions will be adopted by the DSB and most decisions will become um, effective. Now, the um, panels are cons consists of three panelists or three judges. They are nationals of different countries, that, but they don't represent any country. They're there to be independent uh, jurists. And the appellate body um, consists of seven members, which will then meet in panels of three. So you have seven members, right? And from those seven members, you can choose, or they can choose three panelists, and they form the appellate body that will review the decision of the, um, uh, of the panel. Where now we come <clears throat> to um, the, the, the problem that arose is that the United States became extremely dissatisfied with the work of the appellate body. And the decisions of the appellate body um, led the United States, beginning with President Obama in 2016, continuing with President Trump, and continuing now with President Biden, to refuse to reappoint or to appoint new members of the appellate body to replace retiring members. All members of the appellate body serve for four-year terms. And either they are renewed, reappointed, or you appoint new members. But the United States refused, okay? to replace retiring members or to appoint new members because the United States was so unhappy with the decisions of the appellate body. This meant that at, some, at one point, at some point, since you don't replace members that leave the appellate body, that in December of 2019, the number of persons uh, on the appellate body fell below three which meant that the appellate body could not meet because you need three members to constitute um, a quorum of the appellate body. So they could not meet because they didn't have enough members due to the actions of the United States. 
So the question that arises is, well, why is it that the United States was so unhappy uh, with the appellate body? And I suppose we could say that the United States became really unhappy because the United States said, you know, nobody appointed you to be a Supreme Court of International Trade. You have usurped and you have aggrandized yourself and you've assumed powers that nobody ever wanted to give you. And for that reason, okay, the um, appellate body um, really made the United States upset and angry with some of the decisions and the United States <clears throat> was the losing party in a couple of decisions, in a number of decisions, which greatly angered the United States. So the United States essentially said that the appellate body was engaged in judicial activism, uh, which is a term that means that the appellate body was inventing the law. The United States said, nobody told you to invent the law. Your role was to apply the text of the WTO and not to invent new rights and obligations that you, know, that, that you think you have the power to do as if you're some type of Supreme Court of international trade. So let me give you some specific examples of US dissatisfaction with the WTO. And I'll begin with something of a <clears throat> technical case. Well, they're all technical. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> something of a technical discussion uh, because this really, really angered the United States. And this is one of the ca two cases I'm going to discuss that really angered the United States. And this case has to do with the United States practice of zeroing in dumping cases, okay, and anti-dumping cases. So what is dumping? Dumping is when a country sells a product in the United States at a price that is lower than the price it sells the same product in its home market. So say, for example, Japan, because Japan's often, right, the target of anti-dumping actions in the United States. Japan sells a product in its home market for $10. And then it sells the same product, which it exports to the United States, for $5 in the United States. If the uh, home market price or the normal value, I'm going to put this on the board, just as I said, it's somewhat technical. <clears throat> if the normal value, which is what would be the home market price, is greater than the price in the United States, which is called the export price, so that you have a positive number, then there's dumping. If you sell a product in Japan for $10, and you sell the same product in the United States for $5, okay? And so the, dump, the margin of dumping is plus five. That's called dumping. Now, now you would say, well, why is that harmful? Well, it's harmful because, right, the, act, the real normal price is actually $10, and you're purposefully pricing the product at a lower price in order to harm US competitors. What you can do is price the product at a lower price, and then you can force US competition out of the market, at which point you can raise your price or you can lower the quality of your product. So dumping is viewed as harmful, right? And so if this is a positive number, you will have dumping. If this is a negative number, then there is no dumping because then the normal value would be less than the export price, which is why you have a negative number, right? So the United States says that in any dumping investigation, you're going to have thousands and thousands of transactions. And in some of those transactions, you're going to have a positive number. And in some of those transactions, let's say you have a negative number. What the United States does, okay, and the EU, same thing, they do the same thing is that it ignores all the positive numbers, okay? Ignores, it zeroes the positive numbers, okay? Which means what? Of course, you will find dumping in more situations because in this situation, if you allow, if you examine the positive and the negative number, you would have zero, no dumping, right? But the United States ignores the positive number, says it is zero, so the dumping margin is minus five, right? That's what the United States does. And the EU, the EU does the same thing. And both the United States and the EU engaged in dumping, 
And this practice existed at the time that the WTO came into existence. But then countries challenged this practice of zeroing, right? That is taking all positive numbers and assigning them a value of zero. And the WTO agreed and said that zeroing was not, quote, a fair comparison, unquote, as required by the articles of the anti-dumping agreement in the WTO, thus holding that dumping is illegal, excuse me, zeroing is illegal, and the United States must stop zeroing, okay, and must instead consider the positive number as well as the negative number. And this made the United States absolutely furious because the United States said, look, we have been, both the US and the EU have been zeroing for decades. And this practice of zeroing was used when the WTO came into existence. And when the WTO came into existence, the United States said that, a, that the core agreement, for it, the core provision in the WTO agreements, uh, in, in agreements that led the United States to approve the WTO, was that the, the WTO would not alter existing US rights and obligations set forth in WTO agreements. And there was nothing in the um, existing anti-dumping agreement that would outlaw zeroing. And the United States felt really cheated by the WTO because the WTO said the things that you've done for the past decades, right, which we said, right, which was in existence and which you were doing at the time the WTO came into existence, you no longer can do. And the United States said you've broken an agreement because you've altered our existing rights and obligations by making something illegal that we've been doing before the WTO came into existence. That really angered the United States. The second thing that really angered the United States, and there are more, more examples, but I'm gonna focus on the second example, is an example involving China. Um, and this is an example involving China's state-owned enterprises. And it also involves the use of subsidies by China's state-owned enterprises. Now, a subsidy is a financial payment that is made by some kind of government entity to a private company. And of course, a subsidy provides a competitive advantage because if a government pays a company, makes a payment, a financial contribution to a company, that company, of course, can lower its price of its product because, it's because of the financial payment or contribution it's received from the government. And the United States said that China's state-owned enterprises pay many subsidies to Chinese domestic companies, giving them a competitive advantage when they export their products to the United States because they can charge a lower price. And of course, subsidies, ex especially export subsidies, are illegal under the Subsidies and Countervailing Measures Agreement of the WTO. And the United States complained that China's state-owned enterprises was engaging in providing illegal subsidies to many Chinese corporations, which then exported their products to the United States, harming US companies. But the WTO said, however, that in order to constitute a subsidy, there must be a financial contribution, I'm quoting now, quote, a financial contribution by a government or any public body. And the WTO further said that if you're talking about public bodies, such as a state-owned enterprise, it is a public body only if it has a governmental function. Which means, of course, that although state-owned enterprises are controlled by the state, they're not government entities. And they don't have, then, a governmental function, which means what? 
that the payments made by state-owned enterprises to Chinese domestic companies do not meet the definition of a subsidy and thus are not illegal under the WTO. Now this also angered the United States because there's nothing in the agreement that says that a public body has to have a governmental function. And the United States said, you just invented that. You invented that out of nothing. And you have engaged in judicial activism in creating the law. And you've now um, acted illegitimately. And so the United States, and these are just a couple of examples, right? Just a couple of examples of judicial activism that led the United States to be so dissatisfied with the appellate body that it says, said, we refuse to appoint any new members and to reappoint any existing members, leaving the appellate body paralyzed, cannot meet. Now, what does it mean that the appellate body is paralyzed and cannot meet? It means that, in effect, all WTO obligations are now unenforceable. That's what it means. Because if you bring a case, if a, if a, if a country right, violates a WTO agreement, and you bring a case against that country in a panel, right, because this is the trial level, and you win, and, and the panel says that that responding party has acted illegally, that responding party can appeal that decision. And the WTO, Article 16.4, of the dispute settlement body says that if a panel report is appealed, it cannot be adopted by the dispute settlement body until the appeal is resolved. Which means that if you lose in the panel and you appeal the decision, you've suspended it indefinitely in a legal limbo and because the appeal can never be completed or cannot be completed, it can never be adopted by the dispute settlement body. And so the panel decision has no effect whatsoever. It becomes a legal nullity. What it means is that any time you lose in the WTO, all you need to do is to appeal the decision. And once you do that, you've nullified the decision. It has no legal effect because it can never be adopted by the dispute settlement body. Now, panel decisions that are not appealed are not affected. If you do not appeal the panel decision, right, then the dispute settlement body can adopt it. But if any panel decision that is appealed is nullified because it is now thrown into a legal limbo indefinitely. So it means that any time you lose, you just appeal the decision and you nullify the decision which is exactly what the United States did with China when China challenged the tariffs that the United States imposed on China as a result of the Trump administration's more aggressive attitude towards China. And China won in the panel and the United States immediately appealed the decision, meaning that the decision was nullified and the United States continued imposing the tariffs, right? Okay. So <clears throat> what you have here now is a crippling of the dispute settlement system in the WTO. It's the appellate body's paralysis means that the WTO's dispute settlement system can no longer fully function. And that any losing party can nullify any panel decision simply by appealing. Okay? Now, I'm going to come back to the decision, to the events of December 19th, 2019, and what immediately followed. And I'm gonna talk about China because this gives you an idea of the US plan or strategy. Within a month of the paralysis of the appellate body in December of 2019, the United States and China signed the US-China Economic and Trade Agreement in January of 2020, that's within a month. And in the US-China Economic Trade Agreement, the agreement paused the US-China trade war. When President Trump came into office, he imposed tariffs, punitive tariffs, 
on a large percentage of Chinese imports. He did other things too, I won't go through the entire list, but among other things he did was to blacklist Huawei and 140 other Chinese companies who were then prohibited from doing business with US companies. So he did a lot of things. But there was a trade war because of course China retaliated. Um, what the United States and China did was to um, cool off and suspend the trade war through the US-China Economic and Trade Agreement um, because China said that it would purchase $200 billion in goods and services from the United States, provide more protections for intellectual property, especially trade secrets. Um, in exchange for this, the United States would suspend new tariffs that it was getting ready to impose on China. Now why this is very, now why I point to this for our purposes is that chapter seven of this agreement dealt with dispute resolution. And this was very new because under chapter seven of the US-China Economic and Trade Agreement, the trade dispute resolution mechanism was, was created by establishing something called an office of bilateral evaluation and dispute resolution. So both countries would establish an office, a bilateral office, office of bilateral evaluation and dispute uh, resolution, one in the United States, one in China. And the way this would work is that they would attempt to resolve the dispute by consensus, that is by agreement. And if that were not possible, then the complaining party had the right to impose unilateral trade sanctions on the responding party. So let's say the United States and China got involved in a trade dispute. They would attempt to resolve it by negotiation. If they could not, then the United States would have the right under Chapter 7 to impose tariffs on China unilaterally. And under Chapter 7, China was forbidden from imposing countermeasures, that is, forbidden from retaliating. And the only recourse open to um, a responding party was to withdraw from the agreement. Okay. Now why am I saying, why am I pointing this out? Because under this US-China Economic and Trade Agreement, the agreement purports to resolve disputes not only under the agreement, but also under the WTO. So that what you see here, what the United States did in December of 2019 and in January of 2020, was first disable the WTO dispute settlement system. Second, create a parallel system under its complete control for the resolution of WTO disputes to wit chapter seven in the US-China Economic and Trade Agreement. And this dispute resolution system would be under the complete control and domination by the United States because the United States will always be in the mind of the United States the complaining party. So what the United States did was it had the two steps, number one, disable the WTO dispute settlement system. Number two, create a parallel system to resolve trade agreement and WTO disputes that, were com that was completely under the control of the United States so the United States can never lose another WTO dispute with China, okay? That's what you see in this agreement. And if you take a look at the other free trade agreements that the United States has entered into with other countries, 15 of them. And if you take a look at the regional trade agreement that the United States has entered into with Canada and Mexico, which is called the United States-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement, the USMCA, these agreements all say that disputes under the agreement and under the WTO can be resolved through the dispute settlement mechanism of the treaty, of the particular free trade agreement. So this, I think, is the US plan going forward. 
it's going to resolve WTO disputes outside of the WTO. And it's going to decide them in dispute resolution mechanisms that it creates and establishes under separate agreements. Okay? Now, let me talk before I conclude. I only have a few more points left. Let me talk about what the WTO is trying to do right now about the paralysis of the appellate body. There's first a reform initiative within the WTO that's led by the European Union. And this is called the Multi-Party Interim Arbitration Agreement, the MPIA for short. It establishes a substitute appellate body under Article 25 of the Dispute Settlement System, Dispute Settlement Understanding. What you establish under the MPIA, the Multi-Party Interim Arbitration Agreement, is a private arbitration body that is going to be a substitute appellate body that will exist until the appellate body is somehow revived. That's the basic idea. And you have then WTO, you have a roster of people um, who serve, who can serve as panelists in the MPIA appellate body, and many of these were former members of the appellate body itself. And the MPIA will also use rules of the dispute settlement understanding. So you really have something like a, you know, a private appellate body that would be fully functional and would assume the role that was of the WTO appellate body until that body is revived. 48 members of the WTO have signed on to this agreement. But here's the problem. The United States has not signed on to that agreement, which means that disputes with the United States cannot be resolved in the multi-party interim arbitration agreement, and disputes in the United States cannot be appealed to the MPIA appellate body. Disputes within the United States, right, or outside the MPIA, which means the United States can still nullify any panel decision because the United States refuses to use or recognize the MPIA appellate body. Now here's the problem with any reform. No reform can possibly be effective without the agreement of the United States. You can't have any reform in the WTO to revive the appellate body unless the United States agrees to that reform. You will say, well, wait a minute, why can't you just have the reform and say, we'll do it without the United States, and we'll have a majority vote, because there's a mechanism for that under exceptional circumstances. Well, if you do that, the United States will simply refuse to recognize, right, and reject the reform as illegitimate. And any reform that does not include the United States is going to be fatally flawed because the United States is the most active litigant in the WTO, both as a plaintiff and as a defendant, or more technically, both as a complainant and as a respondent. So you're gonna have a huge hole in any alternative if you don't have the United States because you have the most powerful and influential country that's outside your reform. So that's why reforms in the WTO are so difficult Right? It becomes so difficult to do any type of reform. Now, what about the future in the WTO? Well, if you take a look at the Geneva Ministerial Declaration, all right, so the WTO meets every two years. And it meets every two years in something called the Ministerial Conference, which is the highest body of the WTO. And all the trade ministers get together, and that's the highest body. And in Geneva, in 2023, uh, 2022, excuse me, um, in the Geneva Convention in 2022, the Geneva it, uh, a conference, the ministerial conference, issued a ministerial declaration. And the declaration stated that we're going to fix the dispute settlement system in the WTO by 2024. That's what it said. We're going to fix it by 2024. 
So here comes 2024, and here comes the ministerial conference in Abu Dhabi in February 2024, which just ended. And on May 6th of 2024, which is only, what, two weeks ago, the Abu Dhabi ministerial conference issued a ministerial declaration, and the ministerial declaration said, we're making great progress in reviving the appellate body. Three paragraphs long. We're making great progress. That's what it said. So, what is, what is the future? Okay, this is my opinion. This is my own personal opinion. I, I based upon what I have studied and what I see. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. It's just my own opinion. My own opinion is that the United States has no interest in reviving the appellate body. My, my, my opinion is that the United States wants to leave the WTO in a permanently crippled state. That it will be permanently crippled, permanently diminished. Because the United States says that the WTO experiment, if you want to call it that, has failed the United States. Because the WTO rules against the United States. And the WTO has let China into the United States. And this is something else that also infuriates the United States. And the WTO has never held China to its commitments when it entered the WTO in 2001, which was to de dismantle its state-owned economy and to adopt a market economy. That's the United States. That's what the argument is that China agreed to dismantle its state-owned economy and to adopt a market economy. And China has never done that, and the WTO has never held China to account. So the United States has simply said, we've given up on the WTO. We're no longer interested in the WTO. And it's kind of like the kid who, has, who goes to the playground and says, who brings the ball and says, well, I don't like how the game is being played. I'm taking my ball and I'm leaving. And the United States has said, we no longer support the WTO, and it wants to wreck the WTO and leave it in a permanently disabled state. That's my opinion. And this is the view which is shared by not only President Trump and the Republican Party in the United States, but also President Biden and the Democratic Party in the United States. Neither party in the United States likes the WTO, and neither party is interested in reviving the appellate body. Um, again, this is my opinion based upon what I see. It may not be what other people believe. I know people disagree, but that's, um, and that's gonna be the conclusion of my talk. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chow.